letting people in there. All right, welcome everyone. Hey, hey. Bill. how's it going, Bill? Yeah. Bill Happy Monroe's Saturday. Happy Saturday. Saturday. Well, Bill. All right, I happy Saturday. Face. <laughs> <laughs> Hey. There's multiple bills here. We have a Bill Monroe. Bill, we got Bill a Bill Monroe. Magnuson. All oh, right, Bill Monroe. Okay, nice. I have to mute myself though because I'm I'm typing again. So he's clickety clacking. He's always <laughs> clickety clacking over there. Hey, Bill. How are you, David? I am. I'm. I'm really good. Really good? great. I'm very grateful. I'm feeling good. My body's feeling good. Good. Just, That's good to hear. Yeah, it's it's a new experience over the past six months, so I'm, I'm really digging the heck out of it. Good. Yeah, you look like you're uh, up and around today. Well, as up and around as I get, I, my energy's getting more and more and more and more. The uh, the life saving poison took a lot out of me, but yeah, but uh, now I now I can restore and I can feel the energy coming back. It's really good. Good. That's awesome. That's a good place to be in. Yep. A much, much That's better. For sure. Yep. Yep. Should we, uh, should we get rolling here? Should I give a little intro Let's and get we'll rolling. introduce our guest? All right. Very good. Absolutely. So, hey, welcome everybody to the Tech Radio Hour. Thank you for being dedicated, uh, you know, members of this community and i see it as a community i feel it as a community and uh ethan why don't you do the sponsorship introductions and uh, the just initial introduction of our really honored guest and uh All then right. i'll take them sounds good all right, so just uh, up the top here, we just remind you that Piano Tech Radio Hour is being brought to you by Piano Technicians Masterclasses, an online educational resource that offers you cutting edge instruction from piano industry masters without leaving your home. You can find out more at www.pianotechniciansmasterclass.com. Don't forget, we've got the world's first online piano tech convention coming up here, December 10th to 12th. Make sure and register for that. And later today, we've got an awesome turbocharging the grand action masterclass with Jude Reveille. And I'm pretty sure I completed the setup for this. If you register for the convention today uh, before Jude's class, you should be automatically registered for that class. So that's a it's a really great value. That's a nearly $300 class if you were to purchase it, purchase it individually. And we'd love to have you come join us and check out what he's up to. And it's promising to be quite well. I just showed David a little preview of some of the pre-recorded footage that we had. It's amazing. And Jude, really, really excellent, excellent at what he's going to teach in this masterclass. He's just very simple, very clear about touch weight and about how actions work. It's amazing. So uh, we'll uh, cut over here to our, our guest for now. If we have a chance, I might show you a preview clip from Jude's content, but we're going to focus from here on for a while on Isaac Sadigursky, a, a name, a household name in the piano tech community, I would probably say. Yes. <laughs> a veteran of the PTG, and he's been in it for tens, decades of years. And uh, I, I'm going to hand it over to David to give a little bit more specific introduction because I think you know him a little bit better. And then we'll, we'll have a chat with this fine fellow. So tell me a little bit about I, what you know about Isaac, David. Well, Isaac came to this country, I believe, in the late 60s, early 70s. You can correct me, 74. Isaac, if I'm wrong. 74. Huh? 74. 74. 74. Mm -hmm. And uh, from grew up his life in the Soviet Union, now Russia. Right. Um, and came here, was a musician and a music student, learned how to work on pianos. I don't, I can't remember whether he started learning in Russia or not, but he certainly expanded his knowledge here, joined the PTG early and has just been a great, 
piano technician ever since. He's had his own kind of practice. He's, you know, as most of you know, he has a van that's like a mobile piano shop. He's got, you know, tools in there and drill presses and stuff. It's crazy. And uh, uh, that's the kind of practice he has. And that's the part of the beauty of the piano tech community that we're, we belong to. Isaac has a totally different piano maintenance practice than I do. We live in the same city, basic urban area, Los Angeles. We both have been relatively successful and we both love what we do. And we do, of course, some of the same things, but a lot of things that I don't do things that he does and he doesn't do things that I do. And it's just beautiful. And Isaac is not only a, a really good piano technician, who's a really good teacher as well. He's just a good guy. He's, 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 it's an honor to have a human be a colleague of mine in our little community. He's one of the ones that make it good. And most are human beings. It's kind of an extraordinary community. And Isaac is a founding member. Of so thank you, Isaac, welcome. Thank you. I'm honored and <laughs> humbled by being invited. So please bombard me with questions or what would you like me to talk Can you about? tell us, can you tell us how you fell in love with pianos and how you pursued this craft and why? Well, I was a trained musician in Russia I was lucky to be accepted to a music school at age five. So born in 1947, we are talking about a long time ago and studied their music seriously from accordion to clarinet and all that trained musician. And one of the big mistakes I did in my life is uh, with intensive study of solfeggio back in Russia, most of my classmates had developed pitch recognition. That's what uneducated people call perfect pitch. There is no such thing, but it was called perfect pitch. And I was under impression that having perfect pitch, being able to recognize notes on, on the radio or in life on pianists in any symphony orchestra instrument, is I'm totally qualified and ready to become a piano tuner big mistake. And uh, I tried to learn the craft back in Russia and it was impossible to do. Why was it, why were you so curious about it? What do you, say it again, David. What, what, why were you so curious about working on pianos? Why were you so motivated? Well, one thing I, I I'm a pretty mechanical guy. In Russia, you learn to fix almost anything around the house because uh, that's the nature. You can find stuff in stores and you better do it yourself. Many guys just learn to do it. So I was pretty mechanical there. I was able to fix my accordion, fix my clarinet. And uh, I thought about the career of being a musician in the United States and I knew it was a tough road and plan B wouldn't be so bad. Also, I married a marvelous pianist and I thought, well, we'll do it, we will skip the middleman. We will do it, I will be tuning her piano. And again, big mistake. It was impossible to learn it in Russia, except piano majors had a course, two semesters in piano maintenance. It was great. Future pianists could learn basic stuff, about, <clears throat> basic stuff about piano acoustics. And my wife had to attend it. And me, a clarinet player, I was not required to do that. But chasing a pretty girl, I followed her. I signed for, for those classes. And it was a wow. door opener for me 
And uh, well, I tinkled around with her piano, somebody else's piano. And uh, as the myth goes, piano tuner in the be beginning of their career messes so many pianos up that they have to move pack and move out of town. So it happened to me, I messed up a couple of pianos and moved from Soviet Union to, to California. <laughs> wow. Uh, and so when you got here, right. how long did it take you yeah. to start I on piano? I tried to find employment and I couldn't speak English as what you call in the folk language, FOB, fresh of the boat. No English yeah. skills, nothing, absolutely. And uh, eagerness to provide for the family. We had two-year-old daughter when we arrived in Los Angeles. I knocked on a few doors and of course I could not communicate properly and nobody will hire me. Uh, I went through the club of all the Jewish boys, the piano dealers in Los Angeles, David Abel and David Safir and uh, you name it. Nobody will hire me. Until my lucky star, my lucky day happened, I was hired by Bill Finnegan, a wonderful Irish man. He had three piano stores and uh, somebody asked him to, to give me a chance. And I started working there without knowing nothing about pianos. And this was my start, uh, just uh, the old rule the old guys were telling about secret of learning is a rule two to one. So one mouth, one tongue, and two ears. Listen twice as much as you talk yeah. and don't talk back. Just try to do something which worked for some guys for years and repeat it 87 times and uh, many hundreds of times and pianos, and then you can develop your own way if you're so smart. And uh, in those rebuilding plays where Bill Finnegan had, we would recondition trade in pianos. And there were hundreds of those. Plus he was distributor for Aeolian products and huge trucks will come once every two, three months. And we will unload those pianos. I learned how to move pianos too. And then pianos will be distributed to Bakersfield, Santa Barbara, San Diego, all the smaller dealers who sold the Olean product. But Bill Finnegan was the distributor. So there were hundreds of pianos. A huge 16-wheeler 16 will bring 320 pianos, storing Clarks and the Olean's, you name it. So it was a lot of work. But all the I... work there with the migration after the big depression happened in the Western direction. And many guys who used to work at the factories in the old days, in the 1920s and 30s, migrated to Los Angeles. And we had some great guys who had factory experience and they were proud of it and they shared a lot of stuff. But one disagreement we could have is what you do at the factory is totally different in the field. In the field, we can deal with older pianos, dilapidated pianos, and at the factory, mostly new stuff. So in the same direction, if young technician works at the dealership working exclusively on a brand new pianos, once he quits and goes into the real world, he is not prepared to work on older Acrosonics, old beat up operates, people cherish so much. So we all have different styles of work. And again, I saw brand new pianos, I saw used beat up pianos and in need of doing cheap and dirty repair real quick because the truck is coming to get it out and so on. Also working for a dealer, I was able to watch what happens to those pianos and those repairs after a few months, after a couple of years. And yeah. see, see if you did good work. work and what doesn't last. But did they, make, so, did they make long story longer? Yeah, yeah that, was, that was nice and long. I mean, we're, 
yeah. we're about over. So folks, we're going to sign off now. And yeah. no, I'm just kidding. <laughs> uh, yeah. I wanna, so, David may have something to throw in, but I, um, I want to, there's a couple of comments that came in the chat here and we, we, we can talk about them or not. Uh, one is from Cy Schuster. He said, very few people have made every single one of their own tools as Isaac has done. Um, that sounds fascinating to hear about. And uh, I think you'll probably be talking about tools that, when you do your convention class as well. The other comment, which was privately to me, so nobody else saw this. He said, ask him to talk about the famous jar. He bailed me out. This is Jim Kelly. He bailed me out when I needed a brass whip and flange on a chickering quarter grand. Do you remember? Oh, what? <laughs> uh, yeah, I like to modify tools and uh, sometimes working with them, you can see the shortcomings and uh, it's, it's nothing wrong with it. Uh, I make it work better for myself and I shared all this in my classes at the PTG conventions. Uh, regarding the chickering brass flanges, again, working in those early days on older pianos and watching what happens to the industry and uh, many manufacturers went out of business and many, many parts are obsolete. And coming from the Soviet Union where the, we were not used to throw away anything when I see old chickering ready for dumpsters be for a dumpster because pin block is all shut and not economical to, to replace or to rebuild this piano, I save some obsolete parts, especially chickering has brass parts you can't find. At one point, Schaff tried to make those parts and the probably machinist didn't have enough coffee that morning and those parts didn't work. You buy shaft made parts from the 1990s and you will be struggling. So you're better off finding a piano where brass parts don't crumble and save those. And we can have two hour long class on how to save parts from junk pianos, what you might need in the future. And uh, those parts might not take too much room so when it comes to brass flanges from those chickering pianos or Kimballs, uh, if you have a chance, save them. It's not only for you, but for the, your neighborhood, for your colleagues in the area. Uh, people talk about how to acquire clients and uh, they will go into, the, well, piano teachers are good resource, this and that. We forget, other tuners, when younger guys without having the luxury of a home and a shop are in need of parts and they can recommend you. Again, at this age, I'm not looking for extra work, but it's nice to help fellow technician, younger one. Piano movers get in trouble all the time. Something happens and quite often they are accused of something they didn't do. Most of the piano movers in the area are my friends. They knew that they would come to me and say, listen, I have that broken part. Can you help me? And I, I help them out with that broken part. And more referrals can come from piano movers than from teacher. Oh, Here. many, many, many more. But I have the movers know that you are capable of doing it or you have that part, you are the man. I had a call from a gentleman out of a blue sky, 70 miles away. He does warranty work for insurance companies. I mean, the guy needs to have a private helicopter. He flies, he goes from all over. David, you know the distances, Santa Maria to, Santa, to San Diego. He covers insurance companies, wonderful woodworker. He needed hidden hinges, the ones are used on the player pianos. I had them. Even it was not far from me, I went there, installed them. He was so grateful because 15 lawyers were after that insurance company, after the movers. 
for the past 30 years, I'm, and he refers me to any job, just did one two weeks ago. So the bottom line is if you have some stock of needed obsolete parts or average furniture maker doesn't have piano related part and you have it, you have access to it, you have referrals, you have friends, and this gentleman covered me a couple of times on the touch-up jobs. So that's how the world cool. works. I got another comment here from Carl Lieberman, who's oh. also in your area. He yeah. said, Isaac, please talk about our common teacher, David Safir. And is this a relation to Kurt Safir? I mean, I remember that was no. like a piano dealer. No, no they're, they're different there people. Was, you know, there was a Syrian Jewish man who lived some time in Israel. He migrated to Los Angeles. He had training in pianos. And being very entrepreneurial, he opened his piano store, which grew up to enormous rebuilding facility. And quite a few tuners worked for David Safir. Carl started his career. I believe Carl's mom was his bookkeeper. Carl, is that correct? Oh. And uh, again, after working a couple of years for Bill Finnegan, I sort of gained the reputation, oh, this guy can fix almost anything. And uh, I worked simultaneously for three, four piano dealers. To tell you that there was animosity among them, no. They were helping each other. The salespeople on the floor were fighting to make a sale. But those guys had brains to keep in touch with each other and cover for each other and uh, find needed merchandise if client has something. I mean, we live in a fantastic time when everything is on the computer. You can get anything from junk man and from other dealers in terms of inventory. In those days, I had witnessed those older guys, the old school, talking to each other. Hey, David, do you, do you have this? I need that. And <coughs> they were cooperating. They're, they're a great generation of honorable guys. So David Safir operated in Los Angeles for many years until he had developed some severe uh, health condition. He was a chain smoker, three packs a day, nonstop. Wow. Oh. And uh, he died, I believe, in his in 90, mid 90s. But the experience I got there, they were selling dozens of pianos a month and they were totally refurbished and rebuilt. And I followed pianos which were partially rebuilt. And for instance, piano will be restrung with a new pin block and old A graph slab. Wow. A couple of years later, Agra will pop up and they will send me out to fix it. That's how I start my, started my love affair with the Agraphs and my nickname in the community was Isaac Agrafsky. <laughs> but uh, I told- well, and, 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 and I should, I should say that Isaac has been, uh, repairing broken agraphs on all my clients' pianos for 30 years, Isaac, would you say? No, just about, what, only 30 years since you got in trouble, David? <laughs> and just now he's teaching my partner slowly because it's a, removing and replacing agraphs is not for the faint of heart. And what was the first timer? Yeah. So Isaac's been my guy for that for forever. I can so remember. What, okay, go ahead. What I had follow it is why the a graphs break on the freshly rebuilt pianos. And uh, the answers came up pretty clearly from more experienced technicians. And I ended up giving three hour class at the National Convention, I believe in 1987. And uh, what I followed up after David Safir rebuilt pianos is they were all refinished. 
and I had followed pianists like A.B. Chase and Chica Rings and Knabis with Verdigris problem. Really? The only thing that Steinway had that notorious thing. I saw the way those pianos were refinished at David Saphir's place where the case was literally dumped in the stripper and soaked with all the chemicals to strip the old finishes. And uh, just last week, I saw a Chica Ring, 1916, refurbished at his place. And jacks, weapons, and hammers are all frozen with the verdigris. So go wow. figure. Yep. Watch it out, guys, when you refinish pianos what you use and what is the effect. You can see the effect only about 10, 20, and 30 years later. Wow, that's a big deal. Yeah. Um, I, I'm getting here. Uh, yeah, Jim Kelly just followed up here. I'm just checking the comments here. He says, uh, he's just following up with what you said about this. You have a large coffee jar with parts in it. You pay the postage, take what you need, with a reason and send it back. He is a very generous tech. <laughs> we run an other system. I send those parts to the guys. And again, choose whatever you want and send it big. I, I started to listen to my wife. She begs me to downsize, to clear up the garage. Since I put all my stuff in the three car garage, uh, it was never swept. But I. Wow. I well, one of these days, maybe I'll give you a tour of my shop. I have 37 file cabinets filled with parts. And they are classified in a very simplistic way. I have a couple of file cabinets with parts for grand pianos. Two or three of them for vertical pianos. One is totally dedicated to pedal parts. Another one to cabinet parts and so on. So... I, I can live another 350 years and will never use up that stuff. And I, I made it open to the community. The guys can come take it. The, the best example is if there is a broken pedal, I have a, two file cabinets filled with salvaged pedals. So if somebody needs, let's say, the left pedal to be replaced, they can take two buckets with left pedals, take it on the site, see what works, and what client likes. That's the most important, what mama likes, cosmetically. And then do the installation. Replacing just one broken pedal saves you enormous amount of time instead of replacing all three of them. Three times as much work, okay? And then if time will permit, I just brought one little set of tools to modify the pedals in case of you, if you have to replace it on vertical piano, uh, you can do it without a tilter. Very simple. You have it with you? I have it right next to me because first uh, we wanted to uh, do the transformation from my garage. But well, do it. Here in the bedroom, don't tell my wife. Show us, show us how you use it. Okay. Let's say you have a pedal, you found a good replacement one, and here is the pin, which is friction held, correct? So in order to get it out, to put it inside the vertical piano through the small wear opening, you have to knock out the pin, correct? Mm -hmm. If you smack it with a hammer, you're going to leave little nicks on either side of the pin. So to get it out safely, oh, about 30 plus years ago, this little gizmo was sold at the conventions for about $40. A blind tuner from Carolinas had son-in-law, a machinist, and this son-in-law made that tool. So if you insert the pedal inside, that opening, you can push out the pin 
very safely, effortlessly. All right. Now the pin is out. Hold it up a little higher, brother. Okay, now the pin is out. out. This is the tool. It's a uh, okay. And you just put you, you just put the pin. It pushes the pin out. All right. Got it. Now you install yeah. the model. You take this tool inside on your knees, and you can push it in. Correct. Done. But there is a much simpler way to do it. Let's say all three pedals need to be replaced. So three times as much work. Again, it's common practice for guys to carry the tilter and bring it to the client. And then you can bump the wall because it's not enough space and all that stuff. Here is a simple technique. If I mark the top of the pedal right in the middle and right, right above the pin hole, mark hole, drill a hole and tap it. Now I can install two screws on top of the pedal. So nobody will see it from the outside and client doesn't care and God will understand. You got it? So, so now so the you, it goes easily in and out. So when the pedal is inside, I can put the pin in, tighten the screw. Uh, tighten the screw on both sides. And now it's going to be tight. It will never come out. So, so you drill the hole through the top, and did you also widen the hole that the pin goes through, or two ways to go. You can widen the hole, or you can take the pin and knurled part to the grinder and grind it off. It takes seven seconds. Either way. So Very to cool. be efficient, I have that box. And every part of that job is here. They hear a couple of punches to make the mark. For six 30 second inch screws, there is a drill tap, drill tap, a drill bit, and the tap corresponding to it. And a bunch of those screws. And everything is held on a very strong magnet. So there is less chances to spill. And in this department, there are eight 30 second screws. So if I need this or that T handle to do the tapping, extra pins, lubricant, you're all set. So the whole idea of the class I'm going to give about being prepared and to putting together kits for specific jobs is, this is a good example. Everything I need for that operation, I have in that computer, uh, I mean, in the file drawer, in the cabinet drawer. It comes out, no setup time, just there. Every ingredient is here, done three time drilling, three time tapping, put it back, no cleanup time, done. And if you go to the client with three pedals with pre-modified hole, you walk like a hero and you do it seven times faster than the average guy who still does it the old fashioned way with the tilter, with the schmilter, with the big Hollywood production. You don't need it. And if you think I'm very smart, you are making another mistake because this was originated by late Herman Crawford, member of South Bay chapter. Carl and David know, remember Herman? He was excellent mechanic. And he showed yeah. that in the, somewhere in the 1970s. And the, I adopted that system. The only thing I did is organize them because I always remember the 
the definition of inefficiency is when the waiter makes two trips for salt and pepper. <laughs> so if we are, we will end up making some money and delivering service because the majority of our customers want the hell out of the house. They don't want us to stay overnight or have dinner with them. Just do your job, give the bill, out. And usually it happens if you know that stuff, that they are tired of a couple of guys who tried to do it or escaped the job or ignored it. And especially after piano movers broke the pedal or do it yourselfers, they wanna have it fixed. So this can be applied to brand new Yamaha replacements and Kawaii, anything in production today with the pin you can adopt that system. If I can do it, you can do it, guys. I'm going to cut in right here, hey, real quick. Just, just yeah, yeah, please. Well, I was just going to tell people, people, people watching on YouTube, Facebook. Um, now is about the time we're going to cut off the the live stream. There, we'll stay on Zoom. So if you want to join us, we put a link in the chat of those platforms, and you can hop into the private Zoom call. I uh, just want to let people know about that. Was there something else, David, that you that you wanted to uh, me to check in about just if there was any other comments or questions in the, from the peanut gallery i don't have any other comments or questions i know right, um, then I'm, I'm gonna ask isaac a question sure um how has the practice how has your practice your particular practice changed in the last two decades well, I'm trying to slow down. There were a couple of close calls health-wise and my wife 